Dear Entrepreneurial Online Network, Recently, you decided to exploit YouTube's content ID system to claim the copyright on a clip used at the end of one of my educational tutorials, How to Why Make Internet Art. As a result of you making that claim, YouTube automatically put ads on my video with all of the revenue feeding directly into your pockets. YouTube allows its creators to dispute the copyright claim, which I did, and then in the little box where I can state my case, I briefly argued that the use of this tiny clip within my non-commercial educational video and the series more generally was fair use. Fair use, in case you don't know, is the name given to the tiny section of copyright law which attempts to bring a little bit of reason to the madness of what is mostly a messy pile of case law. A couple of days after I submitted my fair use dispute, I received another message from YouTube saying that you, the Entrepreneur Online Network, rejected my dispute and that I could appeal your rejection, but if I did so, you would be allowed to remove my video from YouTube just as quickly as you dismissed my dispute. So I attempted to look you guys up online so that I could address you directly and ease any concerns you might have had about my free educational videos somehow compromising whatever commercial activities it is that you do. But as it turns out, an online search for entrepreneurial online network doesn't turn up much of anything. So instead, I will attempt to address you in this open video letter on YouTube and attempt to get your attention by using the same clip you content ID'd in the first place. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. Embrace it. Change it. Improve it. Make your mark upon it. Given the nature of the copyright claim and the fact that there's no way for me to figure out who you are, I have reason to suspect that you're a copyright troll. I don't necessarily mean that as an insult, that's just the colloquial term used to describe companies that purchase the copyrights to content from the original creators, because sadly that is a thing that you can do, more on that a little bit later, in the interest of making money by exploiting the messiness of copyright law. For example, a copyright troll might exploit an automated system on a website that hosts user-generated content to auto-slap ads on thousands of videos and scrape a little bit of change off of each one. In a sense, a copyright troll is defined by what motivates them, a desire to make money from these kind of shotgun-style litigation tricks. The sad irony here is this has little to do with the motivation behind copyright law itself. This is something I know a little bit about as it's been a big part of my academic research for the last eight years, first as a graduate student and later as a professor. In order to understand the motivation behind copyright law, we need to take a look at its history. I would love to nerd out for a while and start at the very beginning, which could be argued as the invention of the printing press, but that would take a really long time, so I'm just going to quickly summarize the first 300 years or so, which, as Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich unintentionally makes clear during a debate over file sharing, was really all about one thing. What they're doing is illegal. In essence, it's about control, the control of it. It's really about the control. At the end of it, it's control. Control. First, it was the Catholic Church who was afraid towards the end of the Middle Ages of what might happen if average folks could print and read their own copies of the Bible, or any text for that matter. So afraid, in fact, they lobbied kings over Europe to sentence anyone who simply owned a printing press to death. Later in England, Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth both attempt to control printing, specifically to censor religious materials, Mary going after Protestant texts, and Elizabeth going after the Catholic stuff. All because of some royal family drama which started with their father, King Henry VIII. Eventually, industry, the printing guilds in the late 1600s, got a bit more involved, and in 1709, the first-ish copyright law, the Statute of Anne, was established in England. So that real quick U.S. copyright law prehistory is important because it establishes that this sort of common misconception that copyright is some kind of natural right transcribed into law in the interest of protecting cultural creators like myself is actually historically false or a bit inaccurate. It's not now, nor has it ever been, centered on creators. Intellectual property was an idea invented in the late 16th century during the English Reformation, a product of England's ruptures with the Catholic Church, the rise of common law, the invention of the printing press, and the subsequent printing industry. All of this amidst the Enlightenment's general bent towards individualism. Now, let's fast forward 80 years or so and cross the Atlantic Ocean. There and then, our newly formed United States of America copied or plagiarized the British copyright law for itself. Well, not entirely plagiarized, there were a few changes, including most notoriously the fact that U.S. copyright law would only apply to American authors. This is a very important and beautifully ironic point. American publishers were not just allowed to print and sell British works at their leisure, but in some cases they were even encouraged to do so. Because you see, Entrepreneurial Online Network, our founding fathers had quite a lot on their plate, you know, with starting a whole country and all, and one of their big concerns was the fact that this new country had no real identity of its own. They were all immigrants after all. There was no American public domain, which is this kind of cultural version of, like, public parks, a reservoir of cultural material that any American would be free to take 
take from and add to, which would come to define our cultural identity. It was the creation of this public domain, a desire for unique American cultural landscape that led our founding fathers to take British copyright law, copy, edit, and paste it as our own. It's important to also note that they didn't necessarily think the British invention of intellectual property was a good idea. Thomas Jefferson referred to copyright and patents as a public embarrassment. Embarrassing because he understood that copying is how culture works. The sharing, reinterpreting, and passing along of stories and songs generation after generation is, in a sense, what culture is all about. Without copying in the creative sense, not in the mechanical reproduction sense, culture can't exist. Thomas Jefferson once explained in a letter, and I'm paraphrasing here, that this quality of ideas, the fact that they can be easily copied and shared, was a beautiful thing. He said ideas were like candles. You could keep it to yourself if you wanted to be a jerk, but you could also share ideas with people like you could share the light from your candle to help light someone else's candle. And sharing an idea, like sharing the flame on your candle wick, didn't mean you lost your idea. Your candle also stays lit. You could both benefit from the idea as you both benefit from the added light of the second candle. It's almost as though ideas, the memes themselves, like the candle, want to spread. They want to be shared for the, quote, moral and mutual instruction of man and improvement of his condition. End quote. Copying is such an important and beautiful part of cultural production. I could spend a long time arguing that point, and many other much more smarter folks have, but I want to stay focused here. Whether or not you, my dear entrepreneurial online network, agree with our founding fathers is besides the point. The fact is, they knew copying was important, but they also knew they needed some ways to incentivize American creators to help create and define American culture. Copyright wasn't perfect, but it was the best path towards a rich public domain that they could come up with. And we can't fault them for that. As I said, they had a lot on their plate. So the main motivation behind our American copyright law was that if an American author would write a book, the government would do its best to make sure that no one but that author would print and sell mechanically produced copies of that book for at least 14 years. That's copyright, a limited time exclusive right to making and selling copies. The limit of 14 years is a key point here. The idea being that afterwards that book would enter the public domain which was the whole point, the creation of a rich cultural pool of works for all of us. After 14 years, it's time to go out and write a new book for the rest of us. Unfortunately, looking at today's copyright law, it would seem that as a country, we've lost sight of this original motivation of why we even copied and adapted this embarrassing law in the first place. It's obvious we've forgotten because today it's more common for a corporation to buy the copyrights from the original author, even though they're not the ones this law was intended to incentivize. As a result of that, this limited term of 14 years has now been extended to the entire life of the original author, plus an additional 70 or more years. Why that many years? Because creators might die and stop making work, but corporations live forever. It's obvious we've forgotten the original purpose of copyright because today bands have to record covers of their own songs to get around the fact that their label owns the original copyrights. Or because daycare centers in my home state of Florida get shut down for having Mickey Mouse painted on the wall. Or because a mom posting a video of her cute kid onto YouTube gets sued because there's a damn Prince song playing faintly in the background. It's obvious we have forgotten the original motivation behind copyright law because now I've got the these gross ads on my educational video because of a copyright troll like yourself. But maybe that's not fair, maybe you're not a copyright troll, maybe this is all some kind of misunderstanding. I hope it has been. I hope that you now have an appreciation for why as a country we suffer the embarrassment of copyright law. I hope that you understand its purpose is to incentivize folks like myself to make stuff and add it to our public domain. Stuff like this educational video tutorial I made, which itself is meant to teach other folks how to make their own stuff, which itself might hopefully one day also enter our rich public domain. If that was the case, if this was all some kind of misunderstanding, I will humbly accept your apology once you remove these gross ads from my educational video. Thank you in advance.